A Little Plum by Rumor Godden. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there were two little Japanese dolls whose names were Miss Happiness and Miss Flower. They belonged to a girl called Nona Fell, and they were her dearest possessions. Long ago, nearly a year ago, said Nona, when she had first come from India to live in Top Meadow with her cousins, the dolls had arrived, too, in a Christmas parcel from Great Aunt Lucy Dickinson. No one knew anything about them but their names, which were written on a piece of paper in Great Aunt Lucy Dickinson's spidery handwriting. But the two foreign little dolls had looked as forlorn, cold, and homesick as Nona herself. And settling them in, she had somehow settled herself. Miss Happiness and Miss Flower were only five inches high. They were made of white plaster, their bodies of rag, but as Nona said, they were people. Even Nona's cousin Tom admitted that. Their eyes were slits of black glass. They had delicate plaster noses and red painted mouths. Their hair was real, black and straight, cut in a fringe. Miss Flower was a little taller and thinner. Miss Happiness's cheeks were fatter and her red mouth was painted in a smile. Both of them wore kimonos and had a sash high under their arms folded over into a heavy pad at the back. On their feet were painted sandals. When this story begins, they had not met Little Plum. In any case, her story begins with the children. Nona and her cousins, Anne, Tom, and Belinda, their surname was Fell too. It begins with the children and the house next door. Nona and Belinda's bedroom windows look straight into the house next door. The children always called it that because it had no name. Besides, it was so very much next door that its windows and the Fells is, had only a few yards between them. That was the Fells' fault, as Father said. Two years ago, they had had to build on to their house. When we bought it, said Father, long, long ago when Anne was a baby, we didn't know we were going to have all of you. A playroom had been built, and over it, two bedrooms for Nona and Belinda to have as their own. And it was this that had brought the two houses so close. There was a hedge between them, though it was not very high, and there was, of course, the ilex tree. It was the only ilex on the road, and the fells were proud of it, a great old tree that was almost evergreen because the old leaves only dropped when the new ones were ready to take their place in August. It grew between the back corner of the fells' house and the house next door. Its trunk was in the fells' garden, but its roots and branches had spread. Indeed, some of these almost tapped the next door upstairs window. But it belongs to us, said Belinda jealously. Father had wanted to lop its branches or even to cut it down, but mother would, mother would not let him. It's beautiful, she said, and it does give both houses a little privacy. Mother and father did not really like the house next door being so close, but Belinda and Nona liked to look into the rooms over the way. But I wish there was somebody in them, said Belinda. It had been empty for a long, long time, and the windows had slowly become so dirty that the children could not see past them. Well, the roses that grew up the wall had twined right over them. It's getting derelict, said mother. Derelict means shabby, forgotten, falling to bits. And it was sad that the house next door must become that. Why doesn't somebody buy it? asked Belinda, who asked most of the questions. I expect they'll have prices too high, said father. And it would take a lot of money, said mother, to keep up a house like that. It was true that the Fells' house and garden would have fitted into half of the gracious white house that had a garden in front with a lawn and flower beds and a gravel drive round them and a big garden behind. There are 18 windows just in its front. I count it, said Belinda. And in our house live mother and father, Anne, Tom, Nona, and me, six people, which was not counting Mrs. Bodger, who came to clean every day, while in the house next door lived no one at all. Poor house become derelict, said Nona. Nona was nine years old, a dark, thin child. Belinda was eight, a rough, tough little girl with curly, fair hair. Anne was 15, Tom 12. Anne, Tom, and Belinda had lived in Top Meadow all their lives. It was the suburb of a, a, a country market town not far from London, and it was pretty with wide streets, houses with gardens, old cottages. It still had its village high street and its great park as English villages have, though the park belonged to the town now. The children thought it the best place in the world to live in, and it seemed a waste that the house next door should be empty. Then, one September morning, Belinda was late. That was not uncommon. She by, was by no means always got up when she was told. And this morning, leaving out washing, not doing up her zipper or tying her shoelaces, she had just pulled her jersey over her head and was giving a hasty brush to her hair when she stopped 
the brush still in her hand, a truck had drawn up at the gate of the house next door, and men in overalls with ladders, planks, and buckets were getting out. Belinda watched while the men came up the path, and one of them took a key out of his pocket and opened the front door. Then she saw another thing. A second man had planted a notice board by the hedge. Belinda read it, and then with a brush still in her hand, she tumbled down the stairs and burst into the dining room. Guess what? she shouted. The house next door is sold. Mother, Anne, Tom, Nona all looked up at her, but father only turned over a page of his newspaper and said, didn't I tell you it was sold a month ago? Father, said Belinda, and they all bombarded him with questions. Who has bought it? What's their name? Who are they? When are they coming? Where do they come from? And Belinda besieged, have they any children? Have they? Father read a little more, ate another piece of toast, drank a little coffee, while Belinda danced in her chair with impatience. When at last he did speak, all he said was, I suggest, Belinda, you do up your zipper. Belinda did up her zipper. And tie your shoelaces. Belinda tied her laces. And go upstairs and finish brushing your hair. Yes, and you might wash your face, Father called up after. I can see you had cocoa last night for supper. When Belinda came down, neat and tidy, Father had turned another page. She had to wait. But at last he said, I believe their name is Jones. That's a good ordinary name, said Mother. Ah, but these are not ordinary Joneses. They are Tiffany Joneses. A double-barreled name, said Anne. Belinda had never heard of a double-barreled name, but it sounded more impressive. In fact, she could hardly say it. Stephanie Jones, she said the first time. Tiffany Jones, Nona corrected her, and then said thoughtfully, it makes Fell seem very plain. He has mines in the Far East, firms in Burma and Japan, said Father. It sounds rich, said Nona. They must be rich, said Belinda, to pay the high price. We don't think about whether people are rich or not, said Mother, which was not entirely true. Nona and Belinda were to think about it a great deal in the weeks to come, but now there was something else in which they were far more interested. Have they any children? Belinda asked again. End of chapter one.